This is Tom Donahue at KSAN, KSAN, Metro Media Stereo 95 for San Francisco and Oakland here until midnight. The Madi Ivaco at 12, and then at 6 o'clock in the morning, Mylon Melvin, uh, Manny Quiver, Vito Gloom, King Filter, Stella Pastry, and Stocks Plummet at 6 to noon every Saturday and Sunday on KSAN. You know, there was the great sense that it, that it was something of an adventure and that you were... Um, you were using not alien technology, but you were using enemy equipment <laughs> to connect to your own. You know, somehow you had infiltrated the, the infrastructure. The philosophy of the station was you would play records on the, on the air the way you played music for your friends in your home, which is, you know, alternate cuts, you know, several versions of the same song, or listen this is how Janice does it, this is how Big Mama Thornton does it, and this is how Blind Lemon Jefferson did it, you know, 50 years ago. And then you could play all three cuts of the same song. And if you wanted to play a 14-minute cut while you went to the bathroom or got a sandwich, you could do that too. Tom always said it, 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 he, he wanted a radio station that sounded like you were in the living room of a friend who had the most amazing stereo system imaginable and a tremendous collection of records and impeccable taste. Well, I first heard about FM Underground at, um, the station was called KMPX. It was the spring of 1967. My roommate at the time, Carl Gottlieb, was uh, working for the committee, uh, satirical, improvisational, cutting edge, very politically oriented theater company in San Francisco. Anyway, Carl came home from work one night and uh, said that he had heard that there was a brand new radio station on called KMPX and that Tom Donahue who was formerly a KYA Top 40 disc jockey and concert promoter, had just started this radio station. So Carl went over and he tuned the dial and he found this 98.6 on the FM dial. And what I heard coming out of there really changed my life. What I heard was Tom Donahue's voice, which was clearly from the bottom end of a baritone saxophone. It just kind of rumbled. You could almost see his voice come out of the speakers. It, large objects around the flat started to sort of rumble and vibrate. And Tom uh, spoke with a voice that was clearly mellowed by marijuana. I mean, you, this was a voice like I'd never heard on radio before because the context of radio at that time is important. It was top 40 radio, and it was always a flash from the past, and, you know, big voices, and pimple cream commercials, and Pepsi jingles, and tunes that didn't last for any longer than two minutes and, and ten seconds. And all of a sudden, here was this guy speaking to you like you would want your friend in your living room to speak to you, and, and like I say, given the context, it was revolutionary radio at the time. Yeah. We actually met in the, at the committee, which was a satirical improvisational theater company in San Francisco. We met in 64. I was, I was the first stage manager. Howard was the second stage manager. I went to New York and then came back, and then the two of us became actors in the company. Right. We came into the, we came into the company as actors together in 66. Um, and I had met Tom Donahue on the street in about 63, I guess, right after I came out of jail. <laughs> it was a perfect meeting. Well, we, we, we all brought our political sensibilities to the station and to our broadcast sensibility. And our own <laughs> and wackiness. Our, and our, you know, our, whatever our, our warped personal views were at that time. I think also that it's fair to say that uh, the committee, reflected that sense of community that's often referred to in terms of talking about radio at that time. That the, com the committee was involved on a number of levels with uh, community progressive political activities and organizations. And to some degree that was reflected in, in KMPX. The community was just uh, slightly more dazed in that case. <laughs> and then Donahue had been hanging around the committee because we had bands like Charles Lloyd come in on a Monday night, mm -hmm. uh, and he knew that we were, you know, cheap talent. I mean, everybody. We all liked to get high. 
So it was, you know, a perfect marriage of, of uh, uh, talent and exploiter, out exploiter <laughs> and uh, an outlet. I mean, the, the, the synergy of a, a promoter who was in some ways, you know, cynical and manipulative, uh, people who were just happy performing and, and uh, being part of a community that shared values, and an audience that, as of that date, didn't have a voice for their community. So when those elements came together, uh, the station was born. You always have to understand that Tom Donahue rarely tipped in at less than 325 pounds. And, and it was like six foot five, six six. By this time, had a huge mane of hair and a full beard, and uh, the voice of God. I mean, it was a, he was a rather imposing person. Uh, the the common mythology is that Tom determined the best way to find the ideal station for this ideal operation that he'd been envisioning for years was to call, to take the phone book and to call radio stations until he found one whose phone was no longer connected. It was clear they weren't paying their bills. They were a likely target. And that's all I know, is that that's how he found KMPX. I don't know exactly uh, the real reason for Tom Donahue deciding on KMPX, but it may have been because Larry Miller had already gone on the air on KMPX and started something there. Larry Miller was on from midnight until 6 a.m. He was uh, from Berkeley, I believe. Um, and Larry had a very eclectic all-night show that um, was surprising. I mean, it got your attention. When you started to listen to it, you were attracted to the, its difference from any other kind of radio. Um, but Larry had some pretty bizarre taste. He would play uh, Ravi Shankar tune, uh, Raga, for example, and mellow you into this kind of uh, Raga mood. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, whap, slap you upside the head with some Spike Jones barn burner that, that completely jolted you. So, uh, I mean, you never knew what Larry was going to throw at you. you tend, when you listened to Larry Miller's show, you tended to, like, hold on to both arms of the chair, you know, because you never knew what was going to come next. He, he was surprising, but he, he was a mood shatterer, if you will. And I dug lots of things Larry did, because Larry put the basics down of underground radio. One, he, he played long tunes, he played them in stereo. Two, he spoke to you like you were a real person, not a teeny bopper. And three, he, the few ads that he did have, like, like um, Larry, Brake, Larry Blake's Bratz Killer, were community uh, frequented places. Uh, so Larry put those basic, basic elements together. And I don't think Larry ever got the credit that he should for having been the, the man to air the prototype of what came to be known as KMPX. That was, you know, a very dingy warehouse, which had they kept it up, was in the, you know, mo what is now the most upscale, expensive, and happening waterfront district in San Francisco, right on Fisherman's Wharf. It was a great, you know, now it's a great location. Then it was a really shitty warehouse. See, I, I, was, I, I was actually listening with some interest to what you were saying, but preparing <laughs> something else to say. <laughs> it, because my, I was going to say, aside from what was unattractive about that station to the normal radio operators, it was in this beautiful old <laughs> warehouse in the, former, in the edge of the former produce district uh, along the piers in San Francisco, and that that building had been refurbished, and it had those old factory floors, like loft floors in New York, high ceilings, uh, brick walls. It was really beautiful. Now, maybe I'm just inventing all that. Maybe it was all of these crazoids coming in there. Maybe we started sweeping and polishing and 
cleaning up, but I think of it as a very interestingly refurbished old building. I don't know if it was refurbished or it just, it was, it was clearly transitional. It was also 10 years in advance of anybody finding that, that architectural style appealing. You know, probably what it was is yeah. just that it was in New York. 30 years ago yeah, yeah. and we thought it was a great place. Yeah. <laughs> hey, cutting edge, we were cutting edge. Yeah. <laughs> it was, yeah. the, That's why my, my face hurts. <laughs> sounds, sounds odd in this day and age, but in a, in a time of, of community, it's when you try to remember when you met your best friend, you can never do it because like, you were always best friends. I mean, you know there was a time in your life when they weren't in it, but after they were in your life, they were always in your life and you don't recall uh, how they got there. So that was the way with the station. I don't remember how we all wound up on it or listening to it, but you know, one day it wasn't there and then the next day it was and we were all part of it. When you showed us a photograph of the KMPX staff in 1967, the Beef said, I've always been sorry I wasn't there for that photo. Oh, wait, look, there I am. <laughs> which, which illustrates the, the classic line, you know, anybody who can remember the 60s wasn't there. You know. That night after several joints ourselves, I, I committed to becoming part of this station. Um, didn't know exactly what or how. But next day I went down to see Tom Donahue. And I said, listen, I want to be part of this. I've been on the radio. I can do an air shift. Um, I'm, I've got an entrepreneurial spirit. I can take care of business around here. Um, I know how to handle the round file. I can empty the waste paper baskets. I, can, I know where the start button on the broom is. You know, whatever it takes, I want to be part of this radio station. Tom said he didn't have a place on the air right at that point because the station was almost entirely foreign language and religious programming. At that point, Larry Miller was on the air from midnight till 6 a.m. Tom was on the air, I think maybe from 6 p.m. until midnight, maybe 8 p.m., but I think 6 p.m. until midnight. The rest of the day, and those two shows were not producing any revenue now. The rest of the day, from 6 in the morning until Tom came on at 6 p.m., was all the Greek, Greek Orthodox hour, or the Ukrainian hour, or the Chinese opera, or the Armenian uh, church hour, and, and uh, th those programs were producing a revenue. In those days, the FM band was restricted to very highbrow classical stations like WQXR in New York, and perhaps the Pacifica Broadcasting uh, Station in Berkeley, and specifically targeted niche ethnic broadcasting <laughs> and on Sunday mornings because the station's license is just gradually changing from from uh, the ethnic format to underground it's freeform FM rock and roll my show started at noon from 10 until noon was the Ukrainian hour mm -hmm. it was just two hour show I, I, I started on Saturdays at noon and I followed a Chinese opera program so you would hear Yabroshnipop or uh -huh. And out of that, we would pick our segue. I, we would segue into, uh, in, in my case, because it was Sunday morning, I was I always play the Beatles. Good morning, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> and we would be coming out of the uh, ad for uh, uh, package tours to Romania and Bucharest, or the, uh, you know, so uh, strange. Whatever the ethnic uh, restaurant was being touted, and then we. The, just a smooth segue into the good morning, good morning, and it'll be the beef show. Right, that was my There's also the great cross-cultural moments in the booth itself when you <laughs> yeah, be a dude to the fellow who'd been there for the last three hours. <laughs> Smoking Russian or Chinese cigarettes yes. <laughs> and, and taking his records out and so you could play yours. It was, that, was, that, was the, that was when you knew you were at a station in transition. I was 27 in the summer of love in 67. The idea of somehow participating in a, in a rebellious or revolutionary act, taking over, having your own radio show, <laughs> and it was good fun. You have to remember that, you know, that little philosophy in the context of what was available, which was AM, top 40, radio, uh, 
and it was it wasn't even radio at that time wasn't even news weather and sports it was you know uh, top 40 restricted playlists uh, format radio uh, I, I think something that would be really interesting for viewers to do is somehow access uh, top 40 uh, listings for 1967 and see what you would be listening to on AM radio. It was uh, it wasn't what we were playing. fairly frightening <laughs> stuff. It did. There yeah. were guys that were coming from, uh, from pop radio in San Francisco into this who I think had probably been waiting most of their professional lives for something like this yeah. to happen, even if they didn't know it. Yeah, I mean, guys like B. Mitchell Reed, who was one of the, you know, was Tom's no, partner. Tom's partner was, uh, a, you know, a notorious top forty, high pressure, fast talking, radio DJ in uh, the L.A. market, which was, I guess, the second or third largest market uh, in America at the Tom time. Tom Donahue himself had been a heavyweight in San Francisco, but I mean, there was uh, Ed Mitchell, Tony Pig, right. uh, who now the announcer on Regis and Kathy Lee's show. Weekends we had fellows like Carl Gottlieb and, and Howard Hesseman. I did a little show myself. Um, all of us at that time were fascinated with pseudonyms. I mean, that's because we all had pasts, I guess. <laughs> Carl was the beef, Howard Hesseman was Don Sturdy. I went on the air as the Lone Ranger. Um, you know, I have a feeling many of us were wanted, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was the, I was Don Sturdy at the time. I, in all respects, uh, I my driver's license said Don Sturdy. My passport said Don Sturdy. Everything was under the name Don Sturdy um, for reasons I can't divulge on film. But suffice it to say that Don Sturdy was the name of a, a boy's adventure book series. And the published just after the First World War. Kind of like, you know, in competition with Nancy Drew and the... Uh, Tom Swift. Tom Swift. Actually yeah. created by the same author, Victor Appleton, Victor Appleton, who wrote Tom Swift. Created. Victor Appleton was not the author's real name, however. And uh, there was a book called Don Sturdy and the Big Snake Hunters. Yes. <laughs> with which Howard magically identified one psychedelic afternoon. And... Uh, I guess the rest of us were big yeah. snake hunters and yeah. you were well, I, I It was Don Sturdy and the big snake hunters that presented the charlatans for the first time in San Francisco. Yeah, there was one guy who, who was key for me when I was trying to put together Johnny Fever years later. Bobby Dace? Bobby Dale. The Bobby Dale. Bobby Dale. Bobby Dale had been at every station in San Francisco and probably 15 or 20 other states in the continental United States in the course of his career. Bobby Dale and Tom Donahue once judged a battle of the bands during the days of Top 40 AM. And the winning band would get uh, a uh, recording contract with Mercury Records. The second place band got a lot of equipment. A third place band got you know free pizzas or something. So they listened. In the Battle of the Bands, there was one band that was clearly hotter than all the other bands. Uh, and Bobby and Tom gave that band second place because the first place band got a recording contract. Second place band got all new equipment and was free to sign <laughs> with these two guys as their manager. <laughs> I remember I would play uh, a Grace Slick, you know, White Rabbit. And then I would say, here's somebody who makes Grace Slick, Slick sound like a chorus, uh, like a, a, a Julie Andrews. And then I would play Judy Hensky, who was a folk singer who had a couple of hits a few years earlier, who had no airplay, but could belt, you know, a, a blues or, or her original material as strong as anyone. And then I would go, then I'd say, you know, then if we were sticking with, with like a women's set, then I would play. Uh, you know, uh, Janis Joplin and Big Brother, uh, and, and that probably demos because at that time I think the band was just starting. Uh, and you'd find what few women you could. I mean, Joan Jett and the Runaways. I mean, pick, you know, you'd, you'd find some, that would be, that set would be like women in rock. Also, we were blessed, uh, <laughs> A, with the visuals 
uh, Tom Donahue felt it only proper that if you had to stare at an engineer through the booth, that she be comely, shapely. So there were these terrific women engineers. They weren't allowed to be on the air yet. That came later. Yeah. But uh, many of them, I mean, they were way ahead of me in terms of, I couldn't run a board. I had no idea how to do that. But, but frequently, uh, Dusty Street or Susie Cream Cheese, it, a lot of these women went on to become well-known disc jockeys, w would say, you know, if you just reverse the order of these two tunes, it's a great segue. Or, I see what you're going for here, but there's a cut on another album uh, that uh, I, I just think you'll like the head of the track on the other album better than this tune. Does that mess with your concept for the set? No, great. <laughs> Get it. Put it on. Yeah. I want to sound better. So we're all just trying to make each other's yeah. day a little more interesting. Yeah. I can remember uh, getting really uh, a little vehement one day on the air because uh, a lot of uh, uh, the cream was really hot and it just played in town. And everybody seemed to think that Ginger Baker, who, who is a, a fine drummer, but this was a drummer that took it beyond anything anybody had heard. So I started playing some Elvin Jones and some Max Roach and some Philly Joe Jones and some jazz drummers, you know, that uh, polyrhythms <laughs> weren't invented by Ginger Baker. Uh, it was just to play something else. And I do remember getting a call from Tom saying, I think we've had enough of the great jazz drummers. We can <laughs> move on for, okay. I remember um, being completely surprised by a Ravi Shankar raga sort of seamlessly segued into a gospel tune. And that segued into a into a B.B. King tune, and that segued into something like Ken Nordine's word jazz. And that's when I realized that, that this was a radio station that I had to be part of. I mean, it, it, the, the sets that people built uh, around themes, there is no more of that anymore. You, you just never hear that except on an obscure jazz station, perhaps. But You'll never hear the Chambers Brothers doing Time, for example, uh, followed by Ken Nordine's word jazz about time, followed by the Rolling Stones' Time is on our side. I mean, you know, any reason for a set um, could, could be used, and some great stuff came out. Yeah. And, 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 and if you didn't find it on one show with one DJ's taste, you may find it on the other. The great Vaco, Ooh. Abe Kesh. Who, who followed me eventually on Saturdays. Uh, once that, oh God, you know, music for reindeer herders or whatever it was, the, the time by that followed me was exhausted and Baco got on the air. Uh, Lights Out was the name of his show. Uh, he just came in the studio. At the minute I was off the air, the light switch went off, the candles were on, the incense was burning, and so was Vaco, and he was playing blues. You could play anything. I, I, I remember when I said I played Walter Winchell, I wasn't kidding. There was a record, like a spoken arts record, or it was, a, it was Walter Winchell narrating the capture of Lepke Buckalter and the end of Murder Incorporated. <laughs> and it was a dramatic narrative in the typical Winchell delivery. And rather than play the whole record, I would play, you know, a minute or so, two minutes in between songs. I'd play three or four songs, and then as the, you know, white rabbit would fade off the air, you'd hear Winchell saying, Meanwhile, on the other side of town, Lepke Bacalter was meeting with his cronies and the henchmen in the back room of a greasy saloon. And, and, and then we'd go for a few minutes with that, and then you'd go back to music. And right. you know, there were a lot of people in San Francisco at that time that were totally in the grip of the story. The music <laughs> meant nothing. It was an interruption. Yeah, well, I, uh, I, one afternoon, I, I did a Saturday afternoon show for Tom. And, uh, we were the weekend guys. Yeah. Howard did Saturday, I did Sunday. We were both working six nights a week on stage. It wasn't as though, uh, for myself at any rate, I envisioned a career in radio. <laughs> and, and listeners always let me know that that was good thinking on my part. <laughs> but... 
I, uh, I had a, a collection of act-along records, the <laughs> co-star series, where you could do scenes with uh, June Havoc, you know, <laughs> Yvonne or, DiCarlo, yeah, Vincent uh. Price, and there was a script, and there were it was scenes from different movies, and you could play the other person in the scene with the spoken responses of Vincent Price or June Havoc or whoever it was, and in fact, Vincent Price and June Havoc had each separately recorded the opposite half of a scene, I think, from the importance of being earnest. <laughs> so I got those on two turntables and had them do this scene <laughs> one afternoon between music. I got calls. Yeah, I tried to play Lord Buckley. I, I thought that was about as good as humor got. Um, but I tried to play Coltrane, too, because I thought that was about as good as music got. It was interesting. I got so excited about this program and being in on the ground floor of this that I ran out to just about uh, every shop that I frequented, like Town Squire, and, and, uh, and went into the shop, and I'd, I'd get the owner, if I could, or the manager, or whoever was in charge, and I would say, hey, there's a brand new radio station on, on. you know, let me turn you on to this station, it's a hoot, you know, and I'd go over and I'd t switch their radio station off of AM onto the FM band, and then I'd find 98.6 on the FM band, and usually what I heard was <laughs> just static like this, and it baffled me. Why could I hear this station at my apartment in North Beach in San Francisco um, when on, say, Polk Street or in the Haight-Ashbury, you couldn't hear this radio station. What I found out later was that my apartment happened to be in line of sight of the tower that was over in Marin County. Um, but San Francisco, hilly as it is, um, had many shadows of the FM signals. So the station was blocked to probably two-thirds of the town. So I went back to see Tom uh, and said, look, <laughs> what kind of radio station is this if, if nobody can get it? And so Tom talked to um, Bob Postel, who was this 24-hour-a-day little engineer guy who survived on coffee and maybe a half a chicken sandwich a day, which is all the station was providing for him at the time. They came up with this idea of a simple T antenna, which at that time we were able to make out of the old two-strand television um, antenna wire. Then in your apartment or your store, you would take this T and you would, like radio direction finding, you would hold it until it was perpendicular to the signal. And that you could get great reception on. And we were making these antennas, you know, in our little back room desk, and we were taking the antennas and we were giving them to the shops for free. And the shops started playing the station. So all of the people coming into any of these shops, head shops and music shops and hip clothing stores, uh, even some Volkswagen repair garages, um, customers were hearing this, this new radio sound. And it sounded like albums being played, like they would play at home, but then in the middle was this really mellow voice disc jockey who was, you know, um, speaking to you as though you were a friend, not speaking, not yelling down to you as, as though you were a teenager. So pretty soon the lobby at the station, because we were promoting these antennas on the air, pretty soon the lobby started to just fill up with freaks asking for, how do you make that? How do you make that antenna? And we had diagrams printed. We were, we were handing them out. And you know we gave away thousands of these diagrams on how to build this little antenna. You know, if you were looking for a particular song or a style or something that you wanted to weave into your set and you didn't have it, either somebody in the station could find it for you in the station library, or somebody had it at home and they'd bring it in and say, here, you know, just make sure I get my record back. There were people who would bring stuff N, I think that's one important difference. Stuff came into you off the street, rare recordings, or and it wasn't simply people who were trying to hype a product. And, and there again, I think that's the yeah. the line of demarcation is that the station, uh, at least in its most public sense, 
wasn't trying to sell anything except the idea of good music and having a good time listening to it. We knew that, that we were definitely a part of the community when we saw all these freaks showing up in the lobby for the dipole antenna. Um, and people would, would uh, bring us all manner of, um, of food and, and drugs. And very often, as a, as a person on the air, you'd get this feeling that they were doing the programming somehow, that, that the audience was the one who was in charge. You were there just doing like a mechanical robot playing, playing the records because it happened to me a hundred times if it happened once where I would play something and somebody would call up and say, you know, that's exactly the tune I wanted to hear and I wanted to hear it blend into that one. That was just, you did exactly what I wanted you to do. And I'm sure you talked to any of the guys who were on the air and they'll tell you the same thing. There were just times when if there was any collective subconscious, you were feeling it and under its direction. And then you could go to requests, and as the requests were coming in, you could just signal to the engineer, yeah, yeah, get whatever they're asking for. Because <laughs> my, my mind's gone, gone blank. I did three shows last night, got to do two shows tonight. Uh, just, you know, sure, whatever they want to hear. So there was an immediate feedback to the audience, because the people who were out there knew that they could call up and you know, a, a uh, dazed or unprepared or a confused DJ would just as soon take an audience phone-in suggestion as do one of their own, you know, so the, that... I think oftentimes most of the DJs didn't know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> so, I know so, what I'll play. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, have this, I, have, I hear voices telling me what to play. Uh, and, and that stuff would wind up on the air. I remember once discovering mid-afternoon, it was actually pointed out to me by Candy Culkin, one of my engineers, who's a, one of Macaulay's aunts. <laughs> uh, hello, Candy, wherever you are. <laughs> she said, you know, I'm not quite sure how you're building this set. And I began trying to explain to her while something was playing over the mic through the window that I was making a sentence out of the first letter of the first word in the title of tunes. <laughs> and thought maybe somebody out there would get it. <laughs> that, that Harrison's, you know, uh, fascination with the sitar coming out in Beatles music uh, just suggested to me that in addition to Ravi Shankar cuts, there was Ali Akbar Khan, there was Hamza El Din, if you're going to listen to Hamza El Din, there's a whole range of North African music that uses all kinds of strange sounding string instruments there, that, that, that you can start investigating the music of the instruments and music of different cultures, all of which here in the late 90s has really been blended together artfully and very commercially into world beat music. Yeah, Putumayo would have been right at home, that label uh, at KMPX in, in the 60s, because uh, uh, a record that was this rarity that people would play for each other, which was music of Bulgaria, the women's choir, that had just come out and was kind of a, you know, people played it for each other, and music that people played for each other inevitably wound up on the air on the station, and all of a sudden there was like a national audience for, certainly a West Coast audience for music of Bulgaria, which is, you know, Pretty esoteric. The Banshee list. Choir. Yes. <laughs> Women singing parallel seconds, which is not easy to do. But I also remember getting a tape from David Meltzer, who is a, a, a published poet, now teaches poetry and literature in the Bay Area. Um, but uh, D David was a so-called beat poet in the late 50s in San Francisco and had a band with uh, Tina, his late wife, and a, a number of other interesting sort of basement band-oriented people called Serpent Power. I remember him giving me a tape. And I, I listened to it at home and said, could I play this on the air? And he said, well, sure, that's half the reason I gave it to you. But it, you know, it's this guy just spewing forth the most incredible poetry <laughs> over a long vamp that this basement band has put together. Well, that was fun to put on the air. That, that's not something you're going to hear on AM Top 40 radio, that's for sure. We had a small enough listener base where you know, people could like, talk to each other about the station. That's how people discovered the station in the first place. It was totally word of mouth. It's not like they took 
bus benches or billboards to advertise, you know, yeah. KMPX. It was you, just you heard it in head shops, and you heard it from friends. You heard about it rather from friends. Yeah, you say it would be like a revelation. Listen, your radio get get FM stereo? Yeah. Here, wait, just wait a second. Fumble, fumble, fumble. Then there would be the. They would say they're playing that on the radio. Yeah. And, and it seemed almost overnight that the station took off. It was the right sound at the right place and the right time. That's, that's all. I mean, it was just like Lord Buckley said, it's an, like the Mexican jitterbug. It's so obvious, it evades you. You know, it's like one of those ideas you look back and say, well, that was obvious. Well, it was obvious and uh, timely. And some pals and I were fortunate enough to be there right when it started to get that kind of excitement about it. And we had such highly specialized demographics and advertisers. I mean, talk about niche marketing. <laughs> Mylan, who we'll talk about this later, I mean, was selling ad time to people who never bought radio time. And it was exactly the listeners of the station. You know, Volkswagen bus repair shops. Waterbed stores. Waterbed stores, head shops, and record stores. And they didn't advertise on, on AM radio. And there were other contributors to the uh, financial needs of the station, uh, but they were inevitably involved in highly illegal activities <laughs> and so might get sort of a tip of the hat over the air verbally, but uh, you didn't really know exactly what it was that they had done or how they'd been able to do it. You know, which kind of explained our actions too, yeah. <laughs> over the airways. Paper How are they bag? doing that? How do they do that? So the station took off. And there were times in 1967 when you could drive all around the city, go in and out of stores, go in and out of friends' houses, go everywhere and never miss a tune that was being played because it was in the stores, it was, playing, it was played in the stores where you went in. It was played in your friends' houses when you went in. You had it on your Volkswagen bus and you'd pull up next to um, a stoplight and the guy in the Volkswagen bus next to you would be playing it also. Or you'd pull up, blah, 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 on your Harley and that, there's the guy in the car next to you, he's playing the station. I mean, literally, you could go for a whole day in San Francisco, Southern Marin County, East Bay, Berkeley, without ever missing a tune on KMPX. And it began to fulfill that um, community radio urge need that, that we all had but didn't know we had had. The Toll Tower Records chain could be said to have been started on KMPX because they were our first large-scale advertiser and it was a revolutionary concept in record retailing. It didn't exist all over the country. There was one tower record store in San Francisco, in, in San Francisco Bay and North Columbus. Beach. Bay and Columbus. Exactly. And it was an ugly little warehouse. And, in an ugly little warehouse district, but it was Fisherman's Wharf, and they had a lot of walk-in traffic, and they pioneered a concept of record retailing, which is now dominates uh, the Western world. But I think that the, the growth of head shops had as much to do with drugs as it did with our radio operation, but uh, as has been mentioned, they were primary advertisers. You know, you were telling people where you could buy rolling papers and tweezer clips and bongs and... What was all the euphemisms we used for that on the air? We couldn't say, like, for, for all your dope paraphernalia. We used to call it, you know, for your... For your I, I often referred to personal uh, pharmaceutical research. <laughs> so one day, Ron Hunt, who was the station general manager, a man who had just realized that this whole underground radio thing was way beyond him, had sort of withdrawn into the wings, came and handed me a, an electric bill, utility bill, Pacific Power, I think, or PG&E, for $3,000 for the transmitter. Now, that bill had not been paid for quite a while. It had taken him some time, like, three months to work his way from his office over to mine. <laughs> and in that time, the bill had become so overdue that when I got this bill for $3,000, it said, pay this within 72 hours. 
um, or we're going to shut off the power. Now, a radio station without a signal is not a radio station, it's something else. So we, I talked to Tom Donahue about it, and I said, I said, uh, is this serious? I mean, is like it going to go, are we going to go off the air? Uh, after 72 hours, he said, we have to cover this because they'll pull the plug on us. Our, sound, our, our child, our baby, will be stillborn. We'll go off the air, and there's damn little chance that we're going to get back on if we do. So I said, oh, yeah. um, So I hit the streets, and I went out, and I hit every account that owed us a nickel trying to uh, raise money, trying to get advances on the money due us. Went to Bill Graham, and he was way too tight and too maniacally building this empire to cough up any money. I went to uh, Chet Helms at the, at the Avalon, and Chet was too disorganized to figure out if he had any extra money over what he was going to pay the bands to be able to give me any money. And I went to every, all the retail stores. They had had such success with our ads that they had spent all their money buying more inventory. They didn't have any money to give us. I mean, I collected a few, a few pesos, but it's not much. So after two days of really killing myself out there in the streets, I came back into the radio station and, and realized that we were out of strokes. Suddenly, we were in deep, deep trouble. We, later that day, were probably going to go off the air. So I went into Tom's office and I said to him, um, Tom, uh, I'm really sorry. I, 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 it's my fault. I blew it. I wrote all these ads. I've got other pals to write all these ads. Um, and we've got all the foreign language programs off of the air. But we don't have any money. And I can't figure out how to pay this $3,000 transmitter bill. And the station's going to go off the air. And I was almost in tears. And I said, it's my fault, Tom. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And, and Tom just sat there and looked at me and twisted up this joint. And he said, Mylan? Don't worry about a thing. In that voice of his, he said, I'll take care of everything. And such relief I felt. Suddenly, Tom was going to take care of everything. And I took this joint from him, and I went back to my office, and I lit the joint. And I was off the hook, you know. I was, I was out of the crosshairs, you know. Suddenly, I was out from underneath the thumb. And I was also very loaded at that moment and loving it and loving every creature on God's green earth, and loving all the dope dealers that brought all of this dope into the station and gave it to us for free for what we were, the music we were playing. And, and suddenly it occurred to me, dope dealers, of course. They can't advertise on the station, but they certainly are part of the economy in this counterculture here. So I called up mine, a pal I'd grown up with. And I said to him, Rolf, I said, we're going under, man. If we don't get $3,000, uh, within about three hours, we're going off the air. And he said, really going off the air? I said, yeah, going off the air. There's, there's no doubt about it. So he said, well, he says, I'll get it for you. He said, let me go out and back and dig it up. So sure enough, about an hour later, he came into the station with these 20s you wouldn't believe. You know, the corners were kind of missing on them. You know, I don't know if the worms had gotten at them or the mold or what, but they smelled like they'd been in the ground for a long time. Anyway, this big fistful of $3,000 worth of 20s, and he just gave it to me. So I went running into Tom's office. I said, Tom, Tom, I got it. I got all the money that we need to keep the station on the air. I got it, Tom. We did it. We're OK. And Tom just looked at me and said, see, I told you I'd take care of everything. <laughs> And of course, he had taken everything. He had taken care of everything with his cool. The man had just that power to cool you out when your knickers were in a knot and get you to consider the options and to work it out on your own. That was Tom's genius. I have photos of Tom, Big Daddy, uh, with his hair still slicked back and a shark skin sport jacket and slacks at the Cow Palace when he was presenting the Lovin' Spoonful and, you know, God knows who else, but no. the Spoonful was the hottest band on the bill. But it, it, he, he'd been around San Francisco for a while. He, I, I don't... Do you remember that moment at, at, at Candlestick Park? The Beatles' last public performance and concert yeah. was the conclusion of the Second American Tour in mm -hmm. Candlestick Park in San Francisco, and I think Tom Donahue and Carl Scott 
produced were it. the producers. And in those days, even the Beatles didn't do a concert by themselves. They were on with Bobby Hebb. And that was Red Rubber Ball Circle. So it's Circle. C Y R C L E. Circle and Bobby Hebb and the Beatles. And the Beatles did the closing set. And there was this moment when uh, Carl Scott, who was a really big guy, and Tom Donahue, who was an equally big guy, came together on the field. And those, all those of us who knew him said, it was like airships docking. It was like, <laughs> the, like the airship Columbia and the airship United States. And boom. <laughs> we had fantasies at one point of building sort of the hip version of Bill Drake's Top 40 empire. Bill Drake was a consultant, and he basically ruled Top 40 in America at that time, as I remember. Um, but we thought that we could get this kind of community radio going on in, in several parts of the country. And we came down here to Los Angeles um, to do the first one. We, we interested an investor, Lou Avery, and some of his friends into um, uh, buying KPPC. I, I think I'm saying this correctly, into at least gaining control of KPPC. KPPC was in the basement of the Pasadena Presbyterian Church. That's what the PPP uh, stood for. And it was very weird to be playing sympathy for the devil in the basement of the Pasadena Presbyterian Church. But we did. And um, we stretched that KMPX sound down to the Los Angeles, Southern California area in early of 1968. There, there were operations springing up in other areas, just as there were underground newspapers. That, that community began to grow as it also began to mutate. Yeah, KMPX didn't have a, after the first year, I mean, KMPX didn't have a monopoly on the form anymore because in every city where there was, there was always FM licenses kind of up for grabs because it had been this marginal economic operation until stereo sound. And you know, Big Brother and the Holding Company weren't on a lot of top 40 radio stations, you know, so I could say that we, you know, were the first station to air all those San Francisco bands. She and I took mescaline on a roof at KMPX in August of 1967, and, and there was a full moon eclipse in August. And it was one of those things called the blood moon. And, and it was, you know, red. And I remember laying up on the roof with her and her saying um, that she was convinced that that was God's eye looking down on us through the other end of a telescope. <laughs> so that's the only Janice at KMPX story I got. I can tell you this, Hendrix was on the air live within 24 hours of his appearance at Monterey and most people tend to think of Hendrix's break in the States was Monterey. He wasn't getting a whole lot of airtime prior to the Monterey Pop Festival. And the Monterey Pop film didn't come out for a year, so during that interim, uh, he was being played on, on KMPX. John Fogarty brought uh, Susie Q in to Tom Donahue. And the name of their band at that point was the Gollywogs. And I remember Tom saying to him something like, uh, yeah, I love this tune, but the name's not going to fly. Why don't you go, um, go change the name of your band, talk it over with the guys, come back, and then I'll give it a second shot. So it wasn't, you know, but minutes later, it seems, that Fogarty came back in with this label that was still warm that said the name of the, you know, Suzy Q by Creedence Clearwater Revival. And Tom played that tune, and it took off. I, I pushed Mayall's Blues Breakers a lot because I thought he had an incredible run of guitar players in Jimmy Page, in Clapton, and in one other guitar player whose name escapes me at the moment, curses. But uh, a major talent nonetheless. Yeah. Uh, the same with Stevie Winwood. I thought Stevie Winwood was an incredible singer and was stunned to find out he was a white Englishman. <laughs> you know, I had no idea. Uh, it's like the first time you heard Mose Allison, <laughs> this brother's on it. You know, <laughs> whoa, no, he's... With the exception of, of uh, some records, uh, mass media was firmly in the hands of networks and large corporations. The idea that the broadcast media could be operated by, you know, a group of freaks in San Francisco and a, you know, 100 watt FM station that reached a major portion of the opinion-making community. I mean, how, whatever, however you want to describe the demographics of our station. Uh, 
that was uh, that was revolutionary. If you dug what Bob McClay did and said on the air, you made sure you didn't miss Bob McClay's show. Bob McClay's show was completely different than Tom Donahue's or Vaco's or anybody else's. Each personality on the air at that point was like somebody you'd invite into your home, and it's not like going and getting another warm body. It had to be that person. So this sound was, was indeed ours, and yet the owner, Leon Crosby and the general manager, didn't recognize it as such. They, at best, I think, thought it was the music. Well, you play some of that funny Indian music next to that uh, British um, rock and roll band music next to that uh, comedy album, and uh, anybody will listen, you know? Well, that, it wasn't quite that easy. As a matter of fact, it wasn't anywhere near that. Ron Hunt and Leon Crosby um, and Tom and I sort of locked horns on what was going on at the station, both on the air and off the air. Though Ron and Leon were more willing to let the on-air sound continue than they were to allow us to maintain a creative, um, honest policy of advertising. Um, as I said earlier, we always wanted to advertise only those products that we ourselves were already consuming. We didn't want pimple creams. We didn't want any of the, the top 40 corporate jingles. Um, we had in mind that our advertising policy is one that should be dictated by the community. We knew, I mean, we drove Volkswagen buses and Harley Davidson, so there was nothing wrong with advertising Volkswagen buses and Harley Davidsons, nor the repair shops that fixed them. But we didn't want to take a corporate New York produced Volkswagen bus ad and put it on the air. We would rather uh, create a new spot that had a couple of hipsters, um, you know, smoking a joint trying to figure out the dashboard on a new uh, Volkswagen bus. Many of us did not want to play the Pepsi jingle. We went so far as to talk to the agency that handled Pepsi, and we had begun to show good numbers. We, on the Arbitron, we were showing up. We had the credentials to go into, in, into advertising agencies. And we went so far as to ask them. We were so bold and, may I say, so naive at the time as to uh, suggest that they allow us to do their commercials for them. Yes, we could do a Pepsi commercial, but we could make it funny, we could make it entertaining, and we could make it interesting to listen to. And their jingles were, for our culture anyway, not. I can imagine the boardroom, you know, the, the hysterical laughter in the Pepsi boardroom when this request came up to them, you know. And they said, hell no, you know, fuck those hippies out there, you know. <laughs> they, they, they want our money, they're going to play our ad, you know. So, um, Anyway, Leon Crosby and Ron Hunt found out that we were actually considering not taking Pepsi money. Now that to them was some kind of straw that could break their, the back of their financial dreams because if we weren't going to take Pepsi ads with Pepsi cans all over the station, we, not, we might, not be able, might not be wanting to take telephone company ads or or other corporate, you know, car ads and that kind of stuff. And I know that they had visions of, you know, of um, this sound being so hot that we could sell to any agency. They had visions of getting rich playing corporate commercials. We had visions of having a good time playing commercials that we created. So, boom, we clashed. The reaction of many people around the station was, who the fuck are these guys? You know, where did they come from? They, you know, when we were in trouble, they didn't bring us the money. When, when, you know, when we needed things, they didn't get us. And it was like, so what if he owns the license? You know, <laughs> let's teach the son of a bitch a lesson. Ron Hunt was like reasserting himself and, and he was getting all over the, he was talking about programming. He didn't, he thought maybe some of those longer raga, Indian ragas that we were playing, if we could cut those out, we could get more commercials in. One of the minor issues of this strike was my long hair. I had hair down to my butt at that point, and uh, 
Ron actually suggested to, that I cut it so I would be more presentable to the advertising agencies and thereby be able to bring in more money with all these jingles we didn't want to play. And at that point, I realized there was no turning these guys around, that there really was no way out. Either we had to teach them a lesson and get them to back off of us, or I personally was no longer willing to play the game. Many of the other people in the station felt the same. So when the issue of my hair came up, I joined the conspiracy to strike. And strike we did. In 68, Howard and I came to Los Angeles with the show. With the uh, committee. With the committee. And we were performing here. Now, station, in the meanwhile, and Milan can talk better about this because he was in San Francisco, uh, there was a strike for better pay and working conditions by the, by the uh, DJs and station staff. Fifteen bucks for six hours? What more could you ask for? Because <laughs> uh, the station was starting to make money and contrary to the uh, community sharing ethic, uh, there was a lot of feeling that the income from the station was not being shared appropriately. On Tom's last show before the strike, we announced um, that we would be coming out into the street. And we asked the community to join us there in the street out in front of KMPX. And I forget the name of the band who was playing that night, but indeed, we had, we had music, um, um, sex, drugs, and rock and roll right there in the street in front of KMPX. Um, and it went on most of the night. And then we set up picket lines. We also set up benefits for ourselves. I was allowed by, by Bill Graham and Chet Helms and uh, Ron Rackow at the Carousel Ballroom to get on stage between the, the sets of, of the bands and explain to the community what was going on. And I did this countless times, and others did it. I, you know, Dusty Street, Tom Donahue went out there. And you know, we just worked the audience everywhere that we could get to them to try to explain to them that what we were trying to do was keep it a community radio. Um, and for a while, uh, things went fine. I mean, the, the strike went on a good three or four months, something like that. And in the beginning, it was, there was solidarity. There was, there was money for us to live on. There was the community was supporting it. And all, I mean, lots of things. All the people who were showing up at the radio station to get um, diagrams on, uh, for the dipole antenna were suddenly showing up with food that they had made for us. And it was a real terrific feeling. I mean, the community was really there for us. But attrition being what it is, I mean, we were worn down after a while. The offer from Metro Media was for us to bring the whole staff right off the streets and onto the air. They, they said that, that we could do our sound. They said we could do our style of commercials. They said that we could play our kind of music. Um, we could just like make that problem go away like that. Come indoors. But there was one stipulation that we could not bring Tom Donahue with us. Now, that was out of the question, just flat out of the question, because Tom was the one who had verbalized this concept to us. He didn't develop it entirely on his own, but he had verbalized it. He was the main man around there. He was Big Daddy Tom Donahue, right? He was the guy who would take care of everything. So I told the guys from Metro Media that I thought that was just untenable. There was no chance in hell that we were going to go into that station without Tom. And they dropped that demand. So I brought Tom Donahue into the negotiations. We went into Metro Media and agreed, basically, to go on in. There were very, in the beginning, there were very few um, problems, stipulations, very few reasons not to go into Metro Media. Though I had this aching feeling that the word underground radio and Metro Media Incorporated could not find their way into the same sentence somehow. Or that if they did, it wouldn't be too long before they found their own paragraphs. And um, it wasn't too long before 
we found that to be the case. In, in the larger sense, it, it, much as uh, America in the 50s discovered teenagers as a viable market target, that there was a, that if there wasn't really a teenage subculture, by virtue of magazine articles, television exposure, we could create the notion amongst teenagers that they were part of a subculture, and then if we can market all kinds of useless crap to them. I, I think that... P pimple cream? Useless? <laughs> <laughs> I think what, what happened by 68, by, by the time that KMPX staff defected and, and, and was locked out and then went to KSAN, which was a Metro Media station, uh, that, that the notion of the subculture in which we fancied ourselves living was already being marketed. It, it, very clearly, I mean, you know, the notion that if it's on the cover of Life magazine or Time magazine, it's sort of yeah. passe already. Yeah. There was big bucks to be made if you could convince these people, particularly since most of them were so stoned. I don't know, them. Yeah. Most of us were so stoned that we buy these ideas if they were subtly introduced. Yeah, and, and, and the, pro the progressives who saw it happening uh, you know, said don't let them rip you off and sell your culture back to you. But by that time it was too late. And because the price was right. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a good product. For me, the best things that happened at uh, KSAN in Metro Media was what happened in the newsroom and on the talk shows. They were truly community talk shows. I mean, it, w it all could be aired on talk shows by people like uh, Paul Krasner and, and Dr. Hip and uh, Travis T. Hip. It all could be aired on those talk shows. Um, also, the news department, these guys had guts. Um, Dave McQueen in particular, Larry Lee, I think was his name, Peter Lawfer. Um, He's the only newsman I, I ever knew who came to work with no shoes on. I mean, <laughs> Peter was a man of the streets. <laughs> it was going to be nothing but not even sole shoe leather between himself and the streets. Um, those guys took on the Vietnam War head on. I mean, there was no corporate control over the news. And um, in their own way, I'm sure, had a lot to do with helping build sentiment against and illegal and unfair war, because these guys went right at it. I mean, there was no worry about, oh, you can't say that because the FBI will come after you. These guys said, fuck them, and then went right for it and tried to make the Vietnam War look and sound exactly like it was, and bless those guys for doing it. But it was also interesting to be able to talk about that stuff. Yeah, we can say I'm not a newsman, <laughs> but in between cuts, I can talk about what's actually going on in the world, and, it, and I can base it on something that I've pulled off the, I can't remember what it's called, but... Teletype. The teletype, thank you, Carl. Get your, get your, get your I can food. actually look at the teletype, AP, UP News, and just find the article that interests me and just start riffing about it on the air. That was interesting, at least to me. Do you remember one? Uh, no. <laughs> well, what, one of the things that always intrigued me was the equivalent of filler items in the newspaper. Just small items of seemingly no real consequence. The, uh, an example being, uh, yeah, it was in Italy. It was a, a carload of uh, bandits disguised as policemen had collided with a carload of policemen disguised as bandits. No one was reported injured. <laughs> and that was the article. That was it. Well, that seemed to me also a signal that somebody at UPI had the same head that I did on KMPS. <laughs> that this is an interesting piece of news. Let's just put it out there. <laughs> and I want to share that with the community in San Francisco. The community service of uh, good and bad drugs developed uh, by people coming into the station, very often with sacks of, of uh, pills, you know, little gel caps with purple powder inside of it, saying, and giving it to the DJ and saying, please 
tell your audience not to take these. You see, it's got a little P3 written on the gel cap. They're bad. They're going to cause horrible things to happen to your head, you know. And very often the DJ would say, hey, you know, I can't say for sure that this is happening, but we've gotten the report that, you know, the little gel caps with the purple powder that say P3 on them is not anything that you should take, you know. So that gradually expanded and, and we got into into real drug reports and and um, later at K-Stand is where that really got going with guys like Dr. Hip and some of the talk show guys also. I interviewed uh, a columnist in the free press, whatever the local uh, underground paper was, uh, a psychiatrist named Gene Schoenfeld who wrote a column in the 60s and 70s, widely circulated, syndicated in the underground press, called Dear Dr. Hippocrates. And the Do Berkeley Barb. Berkeley Barb. Do Dr. Hip for short. And I interviewed him once and then I guess he got his own medical show, talk show. You know, people would phone in with medical problems. And in those days the medical establishment would not talk about uh, sexually transmitted diseases, about the real effects of you know, marijuana or LSD overdoses or any, you know, any kind of drug overdose. And Dr. Hip was a reliable source of uh, truthful medical information. So it was a community service. And uh, Dr. Hip had two guests on his show, Paul Krasner, the columnist, and Margot St. James, uh, who was uh, by day a process server, and by day and night, uh, I suppose she wouldn't be upset to hear me say that she ran a call girl service and was herself in the life, as they say. Can I also include that Margot was the founder of Coyote, which was an organization of prostitutes. Uh, she and union, she union, uh, tried to unionize the prostitutes in uh, San Francisco, the sex workers. Call off your old tired ethics, Coyote. She also ran for supervisor in San Francisco a few years ago. And the, that uh, Paul Krasner was the founder and editor of The Realist magazine. Sir. Uh, this is good background information. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, so they were talking about something sexual. And uh, Margot fellated Paul Krasner under the desk while on the air with Gene. So it was probably the first uh, on air blowjob uh, in popular San radio. Francisco FM radio <laughs> history. <laughs> and I would say, I, I, I could say nationally, I think. I've yeah. Heard, I mean, yeah. top 40 DJs may have exploited well, there Well, there was talk of taking it national. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a matter of months before my own advertising um, tastes and my personal policy in advertising uh, met a brick wall with Metro Media. It's like they slipped it to me pretty soon that um, it was going to be any ads and all ads, no matter what, on Metro Media, and that uh, I shouldn't turn down uh, any kind of ads. I did work with a couple of production guys. We were able to get some production guys in there to produce some funny ads. Um, and that sort of sugar-coated the pill a little bit, that the, the, there was some very creative radio advertising that went on in the early days of KSN. Um, I mean, the early years of KSN. KSN went on something like seven or eight years. Um, but my heart was no longer in it. I, I felt that we indeed had been co-opted and um, that we'd already created what we were going to create and the rest was just capitalizing on what was once an innovation. So it wasn't long before I started looking for other jobs. By 75, the whole climate had changed. Everything was commercial radio, like KRP in Cincinnati. And we were going into production for the first season, and we were shoot shooting the first show. And when it came to the point of rehearsing the scene uh, where I was in the booth and queuing up a record, and um, someone who will remain nameless, who was a production assistant at the time, uh, said, I've got a great track picked out for you. And I said, what? What is that? And he told me, and I said, no, I don't think that's the right one. And he said, well, that's the one we're going to use. And I said, no, I don't think so. And uh, Tim and I began talking then in the course of breaks in the rehearsal day. 
and went up to Hugh's office at the old KRLA lot and said, listen, we just, you know, we're sort of learning from nameless uh, production assistant that uh, we're not going to be choosing our own music. Uh, that's not right. I mean, that's what disc jockeys do. We, okay, it's not reality. It's a television show. I understand this. So does Tim. So does you. But I want to choose my own music. And uh, since I wrote my whole turnaround speech for the pilot, I, and it, Hugh knew my work in the committee. That's where we first met. He saw a committee performance in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, he said, yeah, fine, pick your own records. <laughs> so the PA was then saddled with the task of getting clearance for the, for the music that we chose to play, which became more and more of a problem as the show went on. But it... it uh, it never occurred to me that once we were really into production, I wouldn't be able to choose the music that I was playing. It, it wasn't my notion to play Ravi Shankar or the Bulgarian Women's Chorus, but, but I wanted, I had a notion of what kind of music Fever would want to play, that he was an anti-top 40s kind of guy, uh, and that he, he would want to play more roots music. And, and, and I also, wanted to do that because I thought if, if kids are looking at this show, if viewers are looking at this show, why do we have to constantly uh, reinstate the notion that, uh, you know, the whole world of pop music began about eight years ago? If, do we, are we really going to listen to music that's currently popular right now, or are we going to listen to the kind of artists who were seminal in the creation of what this music has become. Well, there were a number of stories that were, you know, lifted directly from great radio lore. Uh, I think Turkey's Away may have actually been a story that came to us from some radio station. This was Herb's idea to dump the turkeys and out of the helicopter, and Les is set up for a, uh, a, a live, uh, play-by-play -play description of people receiving these turkeys from the sky. But in fact, uh, I, I know that uh, Richard Sanders, who played Les Nessman, uh, listened to the, uh, the, the famous recordings of the Hindenburg blimp explosion, because <laughs> that's what he was doing. He was describing the Hindenburg going up, except it was turkeys plummeting into cars in a parking lot. <laughs> the thing that got me out of San Francisco altogether was a scheme that Donahue and I cooked up with some other people called the Medicine Ball Caravan. Um, Medicine Ball Caravan was um, basically an idea that um, 160 of us freaks got together in 30 vehicles, buses, Harleys, vans, mail trucks, anything that could roll, and we would go across America and put on concerts. Actually, we would go across America. We had stage trucks and lights and everything. We would set up the stages, prearranged places, obviously, um, and set up the, the lights and the sound and everything. And then Warner Brothers would fly their acts in, acts like B.B. King and the Young Bloods and Doug Kershaw, um, I don't know, Hot Tuna maybe, um, um, Pink Floyd. There, there were many. Donahue came up with this idea to put a little challenge into our crossing of the country he, because he assumed that not all of America would be happy to see 160 freaks rolling into town. So he had painted on the lead bus, we have come for your daughters. Um, knowing that this would <laughs> create some awareness of our arrival in town if our appearances wouldn't. So anyway, we, we met with some resistance, too. By the time we had gotten done the concert in um, New Mexico and then Boulder, Colorado, and we got to the Nebraska border, um, every guy with a uniform anywhere in the state of Nebraska was there at the border to meet us. I mean, not just the cops not just the Highway Patrol and the National Guard, but I mean, there were guys in American Legion uniforms, undersized scout, Cub Scout uniforms. I mean, it was like just this crowd 
of uniform people meeting us at the border, and they made it very clear to us that we were not going to get any of their daughters. And a matter of fact, we were going to just drive right on through the state of Nebraska after we got one good night's sleep over in this field. So they forced us all over into this one field here, and they said, you camp here tonight. And they surrounded us. You camp here tonight, and then we'll escort you to the other side of the state in the morning. Well, the irony was that this field that they corralled us into had been used since World War II to grow hemp for purposes of making rope. And there wasn't a high in the shoebox of this marijuana. But in fact, we were standing surrounded by thousands of uniformed cops up to our necks in marijuana. <laughs> it's hysterical. I suppose Tom was trying to run a radio station, so you know, they did try to get on the air and keep the transmitter functioning and sell ad time and do all those things that you had to do to keep your license and uh, stay on the air. Well, he was a joy to listen to on the air. He was state of the art. I still listen to radio. I, I rarely listen to uh, cassettes or uh, CDs in my car. I, I listen to an FM jazz station, KLON, here in Los Angeles. Uh, because I, I think that Chuck Niles, who's been in the business for over 40 years as a jazz DJ, is an astonishing radio personality. And, and I like to listen to other people, and I like the music. You know? and it, so I could listen to whatever I wanted, and perhaps on a long-distance drive I will choose some things. But just driving around here, I, mean, I, I want to see what somebody else thinks is an interesting sequence of music. And what they have to say about the music, what their personal point of view is regarding this piece of music and these musicians. I wrote a speech for Fever in, on a KRP episode. It was just saying that radio really does just exist out in the air. It's just voices. You know, it's people talking, moving air around in other people's ears. You know, and so whatever happens beyond that, it's some kind of mystical, magical connection, that there must be a way to market. <laughs> As Mylon Melvin pointed out several years ago, I, I was in danger of allowing uh, the technology invented by my own generation to destroy me, <laughs> to stop me at any rate. And I am online now, but I haven't listened to the internet yet. You know, I do a little research surfing, but mostly I, I use it for email. It's uh, it's sort of like radio was then. I'm fascinated by it, but it's beyond me. <laughs> you know? I'll show up and see what happens. Wherever there's something good happening, to somebody else will figure out how to make it pay. That's the American way. Yeah, and the most fun is generally being in on it before you figure out how to make it pay. Yeah. That's why the people who have the most fun are the most broke, except for Bill Gates. <laughs> Eventually, suggestions that we cool it started to come down the pipe from corporate headquarters in New York. That perhaps we should not let some of the disc jockeys who were experimenting out there in the areas of country and western or jazz, uh, more classical, that perhaps they shouldn't really go out there and that we ought to get back to um, something towards the middle of the, the counterculture. And it wasn't that long before Red Dot albums came down the line, where they were basically approved. Now, there was no playlist given to anybody. But in the beginning, it was, well, you had to play majority Red Dot albums during your show. You know? And it was just a matter of time, really, until the original freeform, underground, personality-driven, Honesty in advertising radio was, frankly, co-opted. Um, we no longer could um, call ourselves, honestly, anything other than um, album-oriented rock. See, I, I, I don't remember being convinced that music would change the world, <laughs> but I felt we could make it a better or at least a more interesting place. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> God. <sighs> Left to our own devices, um, I, I wonder what 
would have happened with that form of radio yeah. if it would have just spiraled off into, you know. How you always wonder how it would have evolved if that philosophy had prevailed, if they hadn't come in with playlists, if there hadn't been a strike that moved the staff over to another station where they did have playlists, if the station could have been commercially self-sufficient, uh, theoretically they could have played anything they wanted as long as they got numbers in a rating book. I remember sitting in a theater a few years back watching a documentary called Berkeley in the 60s. Very good documentary on film. And in the question and answer period afterwards, the director of the film got a question from a youngster in the audience saying, how can we start something like that now? And it reminded me of Wes Nisker used to say, one of the newsmen at KSAN, used to say, if you don't like the news, go out and make some of your own. So of course it could happen again if people get the interest to do it, you know? Uh, any and all of it can happen again if people just get up off their asses and go do it. You know, for us to, to wax nostalgic about the old times is one thing, but our energy is expended. The young people want to want to do something fresh. Yes, like, go do it. Of course it could happen again. Oh, yeah. I think it does happen. Uh, on a lesser scale, but, but I think each generation attempts to invent a new frame for itself, to, to change the rules, to, to carve out its own identity. I don't know that it's happened to the degree, th well, no, certainly greed in the 80s rivaled <laughs> yeah. community in the 60s. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the certain cultural standards become elevated and become the cultural norm uh, and you know will freeform FM radio ever happen no not like it did because it can only be the first time once you can never get the genie back in the bottle it just doesn't uh, happen yeah I mean something else will happen and I mean, it might be on the internet it might be in digital satellite uh, niche programming it might be I favor no. brain implantation <laughs> yes. you know small transmitters chips, chips in everybody's head yeah. chips for all Mm -hmm. Chips with everything. Right. And, uh, I'm getting the new news from Jakarta. <laughs> <laughs> Each generation has to find its own, K, you know, KMPX, its own freeform radio. Yeah. Its own community. Just keep your hands on the dial. Keep listening. Oh yes. The news today, friends, is obscene, dirty, immoral, filthy, smutty, ick news. But if you cook it up in a brownie, it doesn't taste all that bad. A U.S. District Court judge allowed the Music Hall Association to break its contract and cancel two concerts of The Doors. The Music Hall Association fears that the performances will be obnoxious. And finally, Richard Nixon says, if we are going to make progress in private talks, they must be private. Meanwhile, the Vietnam War is still going on. And man, that's really obscene. <laughs>